four more hours for dying. <laughs> yes, the, the viewers are coming in now. The stream's not dead. We're here. Hello, everyone. I understand. I understand. It's good now. Hello, everyone. Welcome to week 11 of RIT Sack. Yeah. So remember to please sign in, you know, so we can keep attendance, get, get your membership, get those three meetings you need, or addition to anything else, sign in. All right, check, check that club. Okay, check out our interest groups and programs. Again, really cool. The ones that are st still meeting, really cool, actually. I uh, like physical security. I like, uh, physical. yes, our app, all the cool ones. Workplace, if you haven't joined already, please join. Make all announcements there. Again, really important. Yeah, we sign up for the newsletter. You know, read it. Yeah, Jason works very hard in the newsletter, and uh, they actually pretty uh, get you know the info before club. And hack nights Tuesday seven to nine. Moved on the Discord this week because of uh, RIT COVID stuff, but again, do we do homework? We do challenges. We just chill out. It's a fun time. I. Enjoy it until I have to start working on crypto. Then I enjoy it substantially less, but it's still fun. Uh, yeah, seven to nine on Tuesdays. Uh, there's a position open for the Risa secretary, I think. Uh, message Shannon if you're interested. Uh, yeah, on work on workplace, not Discord or anything like that. Workplace. And swag orders Whoa. close tomorrow. So you know if you want to order a cool RIT sec hat or a cool RIT sec sweatshirt. That are better than the sweatshirts from last year, I think, because they don't have the crappy zippers and stuff. Then yeah, uh, order now because they close tomorrow. You have the hats, looking pretty snazzy, and then the sweatshirts. You know, look actually they look same design, but they look. I think they look better. I don't like the zipper. And koozies, you know, if you want to keep your soda warm. Then buy RIT sec koozie. I'm I, it's it's a meme now. Me, and Mito sponsors. We love them. They're awesome. They'll give us probably a new Steam laptop that doesn't die. Yeah, awesome. We love them. They're great. And follow our social media on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Make cool announcements. I yeah, I do agree. And without further ado. Week 12 cloud with Nathaniel Beckstead. Yeah. Now, Nathaniel, let's uh, get you, get you uh, Sharon. Hello, hello. Hello. Oh, oh. oh you're gonna have to mute. Hello. <laughs> uh, give me. Uh, you're All good right. to go, Nathaniel. Give me a poggers in the chat if you can see my screen. All right, man. I was quick announcements. I wasn't prepared for that. Uh, all right, welcome to Cloud. I am your Cloud guy, Nathaniel Beckstead. Uh, but the last couple of days, I've really been thinking of this as Cloud Week. So Capital One and a lot of big financial services companies, mainly JP Morgan, have been moving to the cloud and creating cloud native applications. They've really been becoming tech companies more than banks. And last September, 2019, Capital One announced a breach affecting 100 million Americans and exposed 140,000 social security numbers and about 6,000 Canadian identification numbers in this breach. And it later came out that this was due to server-side request forgery on an application running on EC2 in AWS. And the attacker was able to use the metadata service to get temporary credentials to then, uh, which were attached to a role, which had the ability to list every object in this S3 bucket. And they were able to extract all of those uh, social security numbers. This was, not a new attack, like people had known about this, but this really brought cloud and breaches in the cloud into the mainstream and 
the mainstream media. So why should I care? You're probably head first in Active Directory. You're real into the Linux command line. Why should you care about cloud infrastructure and all of those acronyms I just blurted out in the last couple sentences? There's a couple of reasons. Um, one of them, you probably hadn't heard of a lot of those acronyms I just said. Those are a lot of new technologies um, and with new technology comes new and interesting problems. So if you really wanna be creating things no one's created before, attacking in new ways no one's attacked before, this is the place to do it. That's really exciting. Another, with that, skills are in demand. Like not a lot of people know about it. So if you do, there you go. Combine that with your security skills and you're, you're pretty set. Finally, big money, not just for you and your cloud and security skills, but companies are spending big money on this. Some of the biggest AWS spenders um, based on just EC2 spending. Netflix is kind of the poster child for AWS. Uh, they've been with them since 2006 when AWS was basically just EC2. Um, and they've always been talking about how they're innovating in AWS. And of course, AWS likes to talk about how Netflix is innovating, showcasing their technologies. And a lot of other big names on here. Um, I don't know if that Twitch uh, is with or without the employee discount, but still a lot. LinkedIn, Facebook, um, a lot of big companies you've probably heard of are using the cloud and AWS in particular. So with that, uh, as a security team, you're kind of stuck with uh, defending the cloud, whether you like it or not. Some of these reasons uh, may include reduced cost. AWS already built their data centers all around the world. So you have those at your disposal. You don't need to build your own data centers. Of course, that cost is kind of built in. Results may vary, uh, but that's one of the reasons you may benefit from using the cloud. Along with those data centers, you have redundancy. Uh, you can spin up the application in multiple availability zones and have that um, running and pretty much guarantee your uptime will be pretty steady. Also, some services like S3 have that built in already. You just upload your file. You don't have to worry about the hard drives failing or your whole RAID server failing. AWS takes care of that for you. Also, same thing with these data centers, security. AWS probably has better security in their data centers than you do. There's a really good uh, video. It's just a couple minutes from Google about their cloud data centers. And they walk through the process of getting your identity verified before you even parked and entered the data center and all the steps you have to go through to actually reach the servers and pull out a hard drive and oh, those hard drives are encrypted. So all of those security measures are uh, built in when you're using the cloud. Another probably big driver for a lot of industries like retail is scalability. So we have Black Friday coming up. If you're anticipating a 500% increase in uh, traffic to your website for your Black Friday sales, you don't have to buy more servers just for that five days, one day. You can just uh, spin up as many servers as you need. You can automatically scale that to your load. And then when that sale is done, you can spin it back down and not spend a penny more that year. Same thing with speed. Uh, you can get servers instantly as you need them and then tear them down as you don't need them. Everything's automated. Everything's driven by software and the API. So it really enables developers, IT, and security to move really fast. There's a good blog post about how Netflix works and they go into everything from microservices, different regions, um, basically, everything that happens when you hit play. Now would probably be a good time to tell, tell you who I am. I'm no cloud security expert. Uh, I'm just a cloud security, or not a cloud security analyst, just a normal security analyst um, working for IBM. 
mostly work with CrowdStrike Falcon, Carbon Black on a daily basis. And I just tend to do cloud, cloud at night, uh, just different hobby projects, um, mostly building in the cloud, not as much uh, working with these security products because that's expensive. Um, but I still enjoy learning about it. You can find me at my blog, my Twitter, my GitHub. Good stuff. Ask me any questions. So you may not even know what is the cloud. You probably haven't worked in the cloud at all. I'm guessing for a large majority of you. Uh, and if you have, maybe it's just that one lab for whatever class that is. You're probably thinking uh, it's AWS, Google Cloud, Microsoft, Azure. Those are cloud service providers. Um, that's kind of what most people think of as the cloud. They let you build on top of it. They offer a ton of different services. AWS has like 175 different products ranging from your basic EC2 up to control your satellites in the cloud. Um, a lot of crazy stuff. But there's also software as a service. This is your Duo two-factor, your Office 365, Slack, and also CrowdStrike Falcon, just to throw in that security software as a service. And these, they're just managing everything for you basically. And you basically just have, you send your Slack messages in the website or the Slack client. There's no server you're running in your server room for Slack or Duo. And that's really cool, especially from just like an IT management, uh, you have someone else to blame. But also for a security team, what if Duo doesn't give you the logs you need to do your investigation when a user gets compromised? Maybe you know one user got compromised, but how do I see who else may have uh, interacted with that IP address or done the same attack? And so these are new and interesting problems that uh, the cloud and software as a service present. Getting into that a little bit deeper, um, here's kind of a bunch of different as a service types. There's way more than this, uh, but this is kind of the basics. So on premise is your traditional IT. You're building everything from plugging in the electricity of the servers up to deploying your application and make sure it's running all the time. Infrastructure as a service is basically running a VM in the cloud. They manage the servers and you pick your operating system, everything from the operating system up to your application, whatever you do on that OS is up to you. You can screw it up and cloud provider doesn't really care, build a new one. Um, platform of, as a service is going a little bit more into management. So this is where you're given a platform to build your application on. I think Kubernetes is probably the biggest one where they manage the actual Kubernetes uh, servers and uh, everything below that, but you can stick your application on there and run that. And finally, I've kind of already explained software as a service. Everything's managed for you, except actually interacting with the application. And there's another slightly different graphic of this that I like to use. It's called pizza as a service, where you can think of on-prem traditional IT as baking your pizza at home, building the dough from scratch up to baking it, and then software as a service as going out to eat and you just order your pizza and it's given to you. I've talked about EC2 a lot. That's the infrastructure as a service for AWS. Uh, Microsoft Azure has, I think, just Azure VMs and it lets you just run a VM. Lift and shift is kind of uh, a point, term coined by IBM Cloud where you're just taking your application. It's probably already running on Red Hat, Ubuntu, whatever, Windows Server. So you can just take that application instead of the server being on your, on your data center, your server room. Now it's running on the same operating system in the cloud. And that gives you all the benefits of resiliency, redundancy, um, multiple regions, but it's still running pretty much the same. 
these have a lot of variation. I just kind of stuck these in here because I thought it was interesting. You can choose two to 128 CPU threads and half a gig to four terabytes of RAM per server. Uh, and there's some GPU options too, but it's a pretty, pretty good variety of options. I think you can find something up that'll work for you. And just to add a few more details, the VPC, virtual private cloud, is just your internal network, um, just your local network in the cloud. And you have multiple of those. And the firewall, you control access to that VPC through security groups in AWS. S3, I mentioned a little bit before, you basically just upload and download bytes. It can be a file system, or you can just upload as much unstructured data as you want. It's really cool for data science because it's pretty cheap, especially uh, for petabytes and petabytes of data. And you can just upload it all and run your AI models with your machine learning models, whatever you're doing. Um, you can also host a static site, which I do a lot. It's just like GitHub pages. You just upload your files and it gives you a domain and it does all the web server stuff for you. Finally, Lambda. I'm a big fan of these too. Uh, it's the serverless function of AWS and it basically lets you run code in the fractions of a second and you're given uh, Everything's managed for you. You just upload the code and basically select what kind of resources you want to give it. A really good example taken from the AWS documentation for this is I take some photos and I upload it to my bucket. And every time that a photo is uploaded, a Lambda will trigger for that photo and it'll resize it to mobile, web, tablet sizes for my website and put it back in the bucket. Um, so I don't have to have a server constantly polling for new buck or new files in that bucket. I know that uh, every time the file is uploaded, that code will run, and I'm only charged for that time the code is running. And if you're really interested in the architecture and kind of the operating system stuff, the uh, environment or yeah, the environment they use is called Firecracker, and they can spin up new micro VMs, they call them, in as little as like 125 milliseconds, which is really cool. And all of this, as I alluded to before, uh, is run by software and APIs. There's AWS CloudFormation, um, which asecure.cloud has a lot of cool templates for that. And there's Azure Resource Manager. And then I use Terraform uh, just because it's cloud agnostic and it has the dominoes module so you can get dominoes while you're uh, waiting for your resources to deploy. But it's really cool because you can define, uh, I want a server with this resources, this security group, this policy, everything uh, in your code file. And you can actually run that through your CI CD pipeline and get and basically your entire network all of your infrastructure is managed in code. You have different versions. You can pull requests and code review your infrastructure, which is really cool. And you don't have to, from a security perspective, you don't have people just clicking in the console, making sure different checkboxes are checked and different variables are filled in correctly. So how do we secure this stuff? Like developers love it because they can just run wild and build whatever they want, spin up a VM when they want, tear it down. But as security people, how do we actually like make sure that's secure? The heart of cloud is the shared responsibility model. And in the words of AWS, it's basically you're responsible for security in the cloud and AWS is responsible for the security of the cloud. Um, so they'll take care of making sure bugs in the S3 API uh, or there's no buffer overflows in the EC2 stuff. Um, they'll take care of that. 
but you have to worry about securing your applications. They're not gonna take the blame when you've left your S3 bucket open. So one of the things that you really need to make sure you have locked down is your identity and access management. And this is kind of the heart of AWS security. And it answers two questions. Who has access to what resources and what can they do with those resources? So putting that in technical terms, you have an identity, which is a user or a group of users or a role, which a resource like an EC2 VM can assume. And that identity has a policy, a couple of different policies in that role, which is just a collection of permissions. And so like I have a database and Joe the developer should be able to administer that database, look at everything about it, look at all the details about it, create it, destroy it. But then the application should have a different policy or role for actually reading and writing to that database. And it shouldn't be able to delete it or create it because that's a little weird. And I went into this a lot more in my uh, cloud security and IAM game talk. Um, there's a lot of interest intricacies about IAM, uh, but just know the basics of it is just controlling who has access to what and what they can do. Here's just an example. Every policy is in JSON. And you're basically, in this one, we'd probably consider it a little bit overprivileged because you're basically giving every action in Dyno, DynamoDB, that's the, the star after DynamoDB, is just saying everything. Um, you can do everything to this books table in DynamoDB. So here's something you might be able to relate to. This is kind of the sudo uh, equivalent in the cloud. So we have a developer and he's normally doing his developer stuff, but every once in a while he needs privileged access to do something. So rather than always being an administrator, we have a separate administrator role and he has the ability to assume that role temporarily, get some credentials, and then he can access those resources with those credentials. And when he's done, they go away and he no longer has the admin permission. And this assume role is really important to tracking who has what. Talking about temporary credentials, um, now would be a good time to talk about the metadata service. So 169254, 169254 is the special IP of the cloud world. So this is where the metadata service lies. You can make web requests to it and it'll give you some, some information back about the current VM. Um, so this is only accessible on EC2 and you can make a web request and say I'm deploying like 20 different servers. They're all gonna have different public IP addresses, different internal IP addresses, different host names. And so when I'm deploying, I don't have to run a bash script or query some environment variables about that. I can get the direct answer from AWS and uh, use my configuration that way. But another uh, popular use of it is to get temporary credentials. So I talked about assuming roles, resources assuming roles before. So rather than uh, normally what we do, you would put your credentials in an environment variable, or if you're really bad in the code and uh, just retrieve those credentials that way. But we don't have to do that in the cloud. We can just ask the metadata service and it'll return some credentials for the current role that we have. And so all those permissions are assigned from the role. I just attach it to the VM and it has access to that, uh, all of those actions without actually hard coding anything into my code. And that's really cool, but also uh, if someone has access to that metadata service, they can get those credentials and use them um, for other things and basically act as that VM. 
So a couple of high level security challenges that we have in the cloud. Um, obviously, if you're every, uh, every permission that a developer needs goes through your security team and they have to approve it and say, yep, you can read that database. Uh, yeah, you can have access to create S3 buckets. You're basically taking away all the advantages of the cloud and you're back to your traditional IT where IT and operations has to spin up servers for you. So we kind of want to balance between letting people do what they want and also not letting people make dangerous or insecure decisions. Also, since the cloud is all just software and APIs, there's no actual perimeter. We have to make sure that we don't accidentally click the make this public checkbox or set public to true instead of false. And it's a little bit more complicated than that. But yeah, there is no uh, perimeter and a lot less security measures um, to make things public. Uh, the main example of this is, of course, S3 buckets. Everyone likes to rag on S3 buckets. They've added some changes to it, um, actually a lot of changes, but there's also like five different ways to make an S3 bucket public now and a bunch of different ways to control access to that. So it also gets really complicated. If you don't know what you're doing, you'll probably just hit all the public buttons to try to get access to what you need. Uh, and that's not good either. The other one that's kind of used as don't make this public um, and kind of different challenges is EBS volumes, which is basically your EC2 hard drive. And you can make snapshots of that, uh, which is really useful, kind of like you would in vCenter. But then if you make that public, which they aren't by default, but if you do, then anyone can mount those and enumerate them for different clear text credentials or just your company secrets, your code, uh, what have you. And finally, visibility and monitoring. If you're not taking advantage of this, then uh, you're pretty much in the dark. You can't see who's spinning up EC2 instances. If someone gets a hold of those, they can just spin up a giant EC2 instance, start mining Bitcoin, and you'll never know until the end of the month when you have a big bill and you say, hey, why do we have $500 extra in charges? But this is also a really big advantage of the cloud. Whereas in a normal environment, you would have to scan your network to figure out what kind of devices you have on it. In the cloud, everything's driven by software and APIs. Just query the API for everything and you get an exact list of what you have in your environment. How about defending the cloud? Um, there's a lot of really cool techniques and things that you can take advantage of, like I just said, to really um, get an advantage on the attacker. We should probably talk about what AWS gives you. That's your SIM, your guard duty service for AWS and Sentinel for Azure. They're basically the exact same as your normal SIM for a, a traditional IT environment. Send in a bunch of logs uh, for guard duty, that's CloudTrail, your VPC flows. And what I found really cool was if you're just using the normal Azure resolvers for DNS, they'll automatically pick up those and send them to guard duty too. And They'll just take all the log data, everything that's happening in your environment, and along with machine learning and normal detections, will spit out alerts for suspicious activity going on in your environment. Speaking of CloudTrail, this just records everything that happens in AWS. Whether you're using the console, just logging in the website, clicking around and stuff, that's still an API action in the background. Whether you're using the command line, just AWS command, or whatever code library, your Python library. Every single action that's taken by those is recorded in CloudTrail if you turn it on. And that's sent to an S3 bucket and you can send those events to anywhere you want. So for example, mine's spray log. And the only thing with these, it's not instant. It can be delayed up to 15 minutes, 
So if you're trying to instantly alert on something and cut off access or um, remediate stuff automatically, there's some other ways to um, speed that up. Here's an example of a cloud trail log in gray log. Um, it basically tells you if you look at the event name and the event source. So we're using the S3 service and we're creating a bucket. And if you look at the full message, it's test me boy 1105 is the bucket name. And what's blurred out is my public IP address. So you can see who's actually using those credentials and where. And then Nathaniel is just the username that I have. There's a lot of really cool uh, open source utilities. Policy Sentry is one. It's made by a security engineer in, at Salesforce. And it really takes those English sentences as close to English as you can and say, I want to read this DynamoDB table. And it'll spit out the JSON for you um, with what read permissions you need because it's not just read in IAM. There's get object, read or put object. There's a bunch of different stuff that may not be clear. So that kind of automates that process for you. In the same vein is RepoKid by Netflix. They open source a ton of different things. Um, this one, you'll start with a general role. So a develop, developer says, I want to create a new application and they're given a default role for that. But then as time goes on, they'll start removing actions that's not needed from that. And theoretically, eventually you get a least privilege uh, role for that application without actually doing anything or slowing down the developer. They don't have to worry about permissions at all. They just kind of do their thing and RepoKid figures it out. And then Security Monkey is another thing by AWS for Netflix for AWS. And that's monitoring your environment, alerting on missed configurations. Same thing as CloudSploit, which you can actually sign up for with your AWS account and basically just give it the audit role, which is just read only configurations. And it'll tell you, give you a report every couple of days, I think, of kind of what best practices you should be using, what misconfigurations you have, um, and kind of just the overall health of security in your environment. That was created by oh, Matt Fuller, I think, who graduated from RIT. And of course, the big thing using APIs and software, build your own stuff, um, which is really important. Also, utilize those AWS. Uh, Lambda activities and build your own tools for automating uh, the automation. So here's an example. Um, AWS just came out with this blog about automating incident response, basically how to collect forensics from those drives of the EC2 instances. And another one is Netflix uh, gave a talk about basically how they give uh, SSH access to production servers securely for their developers. So going way back, back to what the third slide, talking about the Capital One breach. This is basically how it went down. Like I said, um, the, they got temporary credentials using server-side request forgery. But in this case, we're using monitoring with CloudTrail. And when we see that this attacker is using these temporary credentials outside of the AWS uh, environment or outside of our VPC, however you want to set it up, we can alert on that, run a Lambda function, and remove that role from the server uh, so that that attacker doesn't have access to those credentials anymore. And this was a blog post by AppSec Co. Basically, going through uh, how the Capital One breach happened in a technical analysis sense, and then how it could possibly be resolved. And this time, this year, I wanted to give a little bit of attention to 
attacking the cloud and the offensive part of cloud security. So uh, you may have heard of the MITRE attack matrix. Well, now there's the cloud matrix and it's not as complete, um, but it gives you a good idea of kind of how things work. Um, you'll see quickly pick up on that I am is a big part of this and stealing credentials is a big part of uh, attacking in the cloud. There's also a list of privilege escalation methods from Rhino Lab or oh, wait, Rhino Security Labs. And it just lists a bunch of different ways that you can escalate privileges using IAM. And finally, I found this just brag, browsing the security tags in GitHub, but AppSec Co has all the content for their breaking pwning apps and servers on AWS and Azure. Uh, all the content is free. And so you can set up the attacker VM and everything, all the cloud uh, infrastructure is in Terraform. You can just spin it up and break it basically. A couple of cool security tools. I think the big one is Paku, also from Rhino Security Labs. It's basically Metasploit for the cloud. So they have a bunch of different modules that you can run. It's just a command line interface. And you can enumerate what EC2 volumes are in the same VPC as you. You can enumerate what IAM permissions you have. Uh, you can do all those privilege escalation techniques that they mentioned in their other repo um, and a lot of different stuff, which is all automated for you. And the other one is offensive Terraform, which I found really cool. So if you aren't monitoring uh, your environment and someone can just create an EC2 machine and they can do, use it just as a reverse shell for access to your AWS network, or to just be constantly exfiltrating those temporary credentials. Or the third one that I found with cool was I talked about those EBS public snapshots. Well, here is Terraform to basically automatically create an EC2 instance in your own account, attach that EBS volume, and automatically have it accessible at user SRC hack. And you can browse that volume. Uh, I would assume in a couple minutes rather than spinning up and attaching yourself. So how do I get started in all of this? I know that was a ton, uh, but you probably don't even have an AWS account right now. How do you get started building things? AWS obviously costs money, unfortunately, um, but there is the free tier for a lot of different services. I think pretty much every service I've mentioned. Um, and this is how I run a lot of my projects using Lambda, API Gateway, S3. A lot of my projects are covered totally for free under the free tier. There's also AWS Educate, and it's also just linked on the GitHub student developer pack, but you can get 75 to $150, I think. Um, it changes every couple of years. Um, and you can just get $100 one time to fund whatever you want to do. And that should last you a little while. And I think Azure also has a student thing, GCP does too. If Google Cloud comes to campus, I guess they probably won't this year. But if they do go to their events, I think they gave out like $350 in credit for each person that came. And someone just asked them for another code and they got it. So they had like $700 in credit uh, just for attending this free talk basically on campus to so do that. There's also the training website. If you're really interested in a certain service, they have free training on those. And then if you're really interested in working the cloud, you can create an Alexa skill. Oh, it's probably mute one. Um, and Basically, if your skill is run on AWS and it incurs charges for that month, they'll pay you $100 in credit to cover that. So I run mine on EC2 
there's a post on my blog about how I run that. And so I pay $5 a month and I'm pretty much guaranteed $95 a month to do whatever I want with. So what you'll probably need for the demo, wrapping up, you'll need an account to sign up here. I'll get these slides out as soon as I can. And you also want to download the CLI, which is how you'll be interacting with a lot of this. Uh, that's just uh, basically install the C AWS CLI. It's the package for most places. Then you'll want to create your own user. Don't use the root user. I probably should have included the story. Um, a company had their root user account stolen, and the attacker demanded ransom. They didn't pay, and their entire company was deleted. So don't use the root user. Uh, create an admin user, and then basically never use the root user again. And um, if you can, do a little less permissions than that. And then you'll just have to set up the AWS CLI with your account and your credentials here. A few useful commands. Um, if you're working with S3 a lot, it's pretty much the same uh, as you would just on the command line. LS lists stuff for you. CP copies things um, from either from the S3 drive to your local or from your local to the S3 drive. And then the one big one uh, for IAM is, I don't think that's correct actually, is AWS STS get caller identity. And that's the equivalent of who am I in the cloud. And so if you're running that, um, look into it a little bit more. Um, I have an alert set up in Graylog for when that's run. So if they are get, um, if they are stolen and someone runs that, I'll know. And that's pretty much it. I know that was a lot. I'm sure you'll have questions. Um, just ask in the Discord or wherever else. Um, I'll be around. Enjoy demo time. Thank you, Nathaniel.